Hey everybody, can you hear me okay? Hopefully I managed to figure out this technology stuff again. <laughs> Alright, looks like somebody can hear me. At least they're uh, not telling me otherwise. So anyway, um, for any of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Almanaxi or Ben as I go by my real name. <clears throat> and we're going to be doing another uh, kind of in-progress sculpt and uh, talking about the upcoming... Uh, well, I'm not going to talk too much about the expansion, but I'll talk about the creature I'm working on a little bit and the process that I go through, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, let's just get rolling. <laughs> so what we have here, I don't know, can you guys see this okay? Um, we have a concept for um, a gargoyle, which we're basing off of um, a previous rig. It might look slightly familiar to you. This is the uh, original one. Might be a little bit of a spoiler for no one who's played the expansion, but... <laughs> so one of the nice things about, uh, about having kind of a um, collection of already made rigs from the past game is that we can take that same skeleton and make a new creature with the same proportions or, you know, close to the same proportions and, you know, most of the same appendages. <laughs> And uh, we can recycle um, animations that way. I know it sounds a little cheap, but it's a good way for a small studio like us to get you know more mob variety, but also save time on uh, animations and riggings, which is one of the more uh, time-intensive aspects of the pipeline for making a creature. So this guy is uh, fresh off the concept press. Um, just took it into ZBrush last night to try to get a bit of a head start on it for the stream. So let's pop on over to ZBrush and take a look what we got going over there. Oh wow, um, looks like I got nothing going over here. <laughs> Let's remedy that real quick. Get a bit of shader on here. All right, you guys see that okay? So right now I'm just kind of using the um, existing wings as a frame of reference for me. I'll go in there and like change them up a bit though so they're not, you know, exactly the same as the uh, Relic wings. So this, um, we got a question here about uh, if it's Chthonian. Um, it's actually uh, Eldritch, which is not exactly Chthonian, not exactly ethereal, not exactly anything. <laughs> um, don't want to go too much into uh, what that is exactly. You guys know about some of that, I'm sure. But uh, kind of going for a... Um, it's got like a, a stony theme going here with some flesh involved. Stone and flesh kind of a thing. So yeah, as you can see here, um, this is the low-poly version of the Rylac. So this is actually where I started with this guy. Um, because it's we want to keep the proportions about the same. Um, so then I take that and turn it into a dynamic mesh, which actually I can do that for you real quick just so you can see what the heck I'm talking about. Um, if I can find it. So now it's, um, <laughs> it kind of blurs it when you do it, but uh, the nice thing about this, I think I, I talked about this a bit last time when I was doing my last stream, but um, the nice thing about being a dynamic mesh is that you can basically, oops, let me put some symmetry on real quick. You can basically extrude everything however you want, and you can see the wireframe is pretty jacked right now, so that's, that's pretty terrible for sculpting on, but with dynamic mesh on, you can just kind of do a um, control click drag, and it'll automatically retopologize it, so now you've got these nice clean quads. Uh, which is much better for doing fine details like, you know, sculpting in crevices and valleys and, sh and crap like that. Um, so yeah, this is a good place to start, um, especially when you already have kind of preset proportions for your monster. So from there, I basically just smoothed out all of his um, tentacles and weird holy bits <laughs> and uh, ended up with this guy here, which is very exciting, I know. Um, looks kind of cute, actually, doesn't he? 
Let's see what's going on here in the questions. Anything over here? <laughs> ZBrush is such cheat mode. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it really changed lives um, when it came out. Um, I mean, clearly it made games look a lot better, but um, just having something that's closer to real life sculpture, it's it's still kind of awkward even compared to real sculpture, but it's so much better than trying to do this all on like a traditional um, modeling program like 3D Studio Max or Maya because it gives you that sort of intuitive, uh, natural flow. Uh, got a question, do I use a stylus or a 3D mouse? Uh, <laughs> I have never used a 3D mouse. Um, I actually use a, um, a Cintiq um, and that comes with a stylus here. So then you just draw straight on the screen with that thing. Give them a set of creepy appendages like that instead of wings. <laughs> well, we want to have the wings for um, game mechanics, so we don't want to get rid of that too much. Just something cool about having a guy swoop down from the sky, you know? Um, anyway, this was, uh, this was the next phase, so basically just trying to get more of the general form blocked in, get some of those armor plates showing up and his horns defined a little better. Still really rough. I like to keep it... Uh, pretty loose at this point because once you start kind of nailing down details you find yourself getting too caught up in the in the little you know finesses of, of making a character and you can sometimes lose track of uh, the overall proportions and just the overall look and so that turned into this guy um, still pretty rough I think I might have skipped a couple steps but uh, here's oh wait sorry Here's where I am right now. So this guy, um, funny thing is, there's not really that big of a difference in detail between these guys. This is like one more subdivision level, but just that much subdivision level, <clears throat> you can already start pulling in a lot of uh, the more medium-sized details. Um, Create entertainment. I have a friend who does work for a game called Kerbal Space Program. Oh yeah, I know that one. As a contractor, and, and uh, he does a lot of mods too. He says 3D Mouse is goat. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm actually not familiar with that. <laughs> I assume that means it's good. Uh, I've never, I don't know, I thought they were pretty expensive. But um, I've been pretty happy with just using a stylus and my Cintiq. Um, it kind of makes it feel more like you're using a, uh, I mean, it's not exactly like sculpting, but it gives you like a more natural feeling like when you're drawing. Greatest of all time is what GOAT means. Okay, good to know. Um, does your friend uh, also have a Cintiq or a Stylus, just out of curiosity? <laughs> 350, yeah. <laughs> I feel like uh, artists kind of get the short end of the stick when it comes to the cost of uh, tools for making stuff. Um, Cintiqs are also not cheap. It's like a monitor, but not. <laughs> so today, uh, I thought it'd be fun to kind of take what we got here and try to take this guy to the next detail level. Um, not the whole thing, because I would take too long, but um, I was thinking I'd start with the face and just kind of see where we get for the stream. And um, maybe near the end, I'll uh, squeeze in a couple of other monsters that uh, might be a little bit of a spoiler, might, might be something a little bit familiar to you guys. Um, so yeah, let's see where we get for this. Um, as you can see, this guy isn't quite like fully detailed. I kind of skip the hands because hands suck, and I usually save those for last because I mostly because I don't want to do them, but you have to do the hands eventually. So, this isn't exactly how I normally do it, but I'm going to go ahead and click divide on this guy again. So now we're at. Um, about 700,000 points, which I think that roughly translates to like 1.8 million triangles in ZBrush talk, because it counts in quads. So when I'm sculpting, whoa, that feels way too strong. When I'm sculpting, I usually work with this um, damn standard. <laughs> it's a pretty good uh, basic place for making kind of sharp but not too sharp crevices and extrusions. 
So the nice thing about kind of blocking in the, um, the rough details initially is that when you're coming in here with uh, the fine stuff, it kind of feels like you're just putting in like a sharpen filter on everything. I mean, it's <laughs> obviously a bit more time consuming than that, but you don't have to guess as much as like, okay, do I need, you know, more details here? At least I, I mean, these like teeth look like crap right now, but at least there's like a shadow of teeth right there. So I can kind of figure out without having to guess too much what, what I'm doing. That's an important thing when you're getting into the fine details, because if you, if you start guessing on the fine details, you end up with stuff that, well, from my experience, doesn't look as good. <laughs> so one of the nice things about uh, ZBrush is you can also hide stuff when you're not working on particular areas, so um, when you start working on close-up areas like this, you'll find sometimes that you're, if you're like at this angle, you might draw like on parts you don't mean to. So what I, I usually do is I'll just do like a drag selection to hide everything but the area I'm working on, and then it's just nice and clean. You don't have to have all that visual clutter in the background. Theme for Eldritch Mobs going to be mostly without eyes. <laughs> Would make me uncomfortable. Basically, what I'm, what I want. Okay, that's that's great because um, we always like making players uncomfortable. You know. <laughs> I think there was um, there was a video I saw a, a little while ago of uh, a woman streaming Grim Dawn, <laughs> and she encountered the Log Horian for the first time, and and her expression on screen was just kind of like this grotesque disbelief, and <laughs> I have to say it, it did kind of make my day. We aim to gross people out, after all. <laughs> hey, Structo. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right, but uh, you haven't missed much so far. Just talking about um, upcoming monsters for the expansion and doing a little uh, in-progress sculpting, kind of a, a demo and talking about how it all works. And I'm here to answer your questions if I see them. I apologize if I don't. Sometimes I won't catch the ones that go by. I'm also not great at this whole talking to myself thing. <laughs> Someone called the log a vagina monster. Yeah, that sounds accurate. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's an exclusive uh, title that this streamer gave it, though. Well, you know, we don't want to give anyone a heart attack, but um, it's good to it's good to give people a run for their money occasionally. But yeah, somebody commented about the um, the faceless monsters, and there's just something inherently creepy, I think, about something that, especially if it has like big, sharp teeth but no face. I don't know. Maybe it's just something in the human brain that <laughs> makes us afraid of that kind of thing. I don't know. Don't know enough about human psychology to make any claims there. So when I'm sculpting stuff like this, it's usually a good idea to have some form of reference for what I'm going off of, which in this case would be kind of a wrinkly lava rock, but, um, you know, since I'm streaming, I'm just going to kind of wing it. But I have done a few wrinkly lava sculpts in the past, so it's not like total guesswork at this point. Just, you know, maybe 60% guesswork, which is about where we want it. You know, you want a little bit of guesswork. Keeps it fresh. Okay, I got a question here. How do you make the monster look like they're made of stone? Does it come down to the details in the sculpting or more down to how textures, colors are used? Um, both. <laughs> so part of the stone look is um, the faceted, hard-edged look, right? 
Um, stone is actually, uh, well, depending on the stone family, but stone is typically more of a structural look than an actual textural look. Like if you look at stone up close, it's just kind of a noisy um, kind of pattern of color usually, and even, even sometimes like pretty subtle colors. So what I found with stone is it's usually um, better to rely more on, on the sculpt to try to get that nice hard chisel look. But I mean, the color is important, obviously. If you had, you know, a pink uh, sculpture, it wouldn't look like stone unless you had spray painted a stone pink, I guess. But <laughs> I think most people wouldn't recognize it as stone then. Yeah, so uh, Alien, one of the greatest horror movies of all time, and the faceless monster has reached cult status. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it's probably just worked into my subconscious as well as most people. But I do feel like uh, Geiger was particularly good at kind of tapping into like <laughs> primal fears. I don't think that you know our fear of that kind of design came out of his creation. I think it was already there, and he just kind of tapped into it. If that makes any sense, at least that's my theory. Sticking with it. I mean, it's always kind of tough when you're making something because you don't know how other people are going to interpret it. Um, you kind of just go off of what you think is creepy or weird and hope that everybody else thinks the same thing. <laughs> Sometimes it kind of backfires and people think stuff you make looks cute when it's supposed to look scary, but. Yeah, you know, can't always win. So I'll be kind of amazed if um, I make it through this entire stream without my Cintiq freaking out on me. These things are uh, are both pretty awesome tools, and they're also buggy as hell. <laughs> I feel like it's a daily occurrence where I have to um, restart my Cintiq drivers. Like the, the cursor will just kind of bug out and go all over the screen like willy-nilly. The devourers come to mind as for being semi-adorable. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can I can kind of see that. Um, they're kind of like ador adorifying? Is that a word? That sounds like a word. <laughs> it's a word now. Uh, yeah, so somebody asked what, what I'm sculpting right now. This is going to be um, an Eldritch Gargoyle. Get a more full screen look for you if you want. Right now I'm just sharpening up the details on him. Oh, sorry, that's a little bit far away. So he's also going to have these uh, wings in the... They're going to look a little different when I'm done with them. But that idea... You guys just want everything to be items, don't you? So this will be stone and then suddenly come to life? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, got a question here. Is this a unique monster you're working on or will it be one that will come in lar large groups? And if the latter, holy crap, that's a lot of detail to put into a common monster type. Um, so this is going to be just, uh, I mean, I can't really speak for the designers here on this one, but this is going to be a, a mob that you fight. It's not like a specifically a boss monster, if that's what you meant. Um, but yeah, uh, the detail, um, it's kind of sometimes a fine line um, of putting too much into it and not enough. <laughs> Um, our particular engine and style of game is actually, I think, a really nice balance because, um, I mean, this is actually, if you look at a lot of the, like AAA games, the kind of detail I'm putting in here, it seems like a lot, but it's actually not even that much compared to games that have, you know, characters with like 50,000 triangles or whatever. I don't know what the new standard is. Um, but our, our engine and our style of game, I think, is preferable for me because it's, 
it's just far enough away from the camera that you know you kind of need to have some detail to make sure that these things hold up when you zoom in but you can also get away with kind of cutting a few corners so it makes for the the actual timeline on making these monsters a lot faster you know instead of spending several weeks on a monster you can usually pull one of these off in like a week or so roughly Ultimately, I want to wear a mob skull as a helm. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of, don't we have some stuff kind of like that? I mean, I guess we have like masks, so it's not quite the same. <laughs> yeah, are we considered AAA? Uh, I think I think Xantai has a pretty good answer there. <laughs> I mean, I think if you look at the full spectrum of how much money is spent on games, we're definitely not in the AAA category. Um, I don't think we're in the B category. <laughs> Somewhere in between. So as you can see, I'm basically just using the same tool here. Um, this one carries most of the weight for me when I when I sculpt. I'd say the the damn standard is probably uh, probably about 80% of my time is with that tool. It just has like a really nice you can get really nice sharp edges with it, but you can also kind of widen it out um, if you want to. I don't usually use it when it's wider, but you can. Yeah, I, this, uh, I think AA refers mainly to the budget of a game, so GD isn't one, but still, who cares? <laughs> well, thanks, man. Uh, or, or not, I don't know. It's it's like, a, I'm not really sure if there's a hard def definition of it, but yeah, I kind of agree with that. Um, I think how much you spend on your on your title definitely kind of puts it in, or at least it's part of it, a large portion of it. I mean, there have been some games that, you know, had a ton of money spent on them and they still didn't turn out great, but... I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if that still counts as a AAA or not. <laughs> like, what would you call a game that had millions and millions spent on it and then turned out to be crap? Is that still considered the AAA tier? I'm not even sure if it's a quality thing. <clears throat> Alright, I think I've spent enough time messing around with those horns for now. Let's try to get some definition on the jawline here. <laughs> there are plenty of games that have millions and millions spent on it and turn out like crap. Take any Ubisoft title for example. So yeah, I mean, if you if you consider that, then um, I think AAA is more of a tier of how much money is spent. But you know, I think we kind of live in um, the golden I don't know if you call it the renaissance <laughs> of uh, of indie games because there's so many small studios out there that are making great products um, and not you know breaking the bank making them. And I think it's really cool that people um, are a supporting companies like that and B, that these companies are able to sustain themselves. Because I think we get a lot, um, I mean, I think that's great, you know, some, some AAA games, I'm sure, you know, like are amazing experiences and you can't really get that in some indie games, but I mean, there's just some things that you, you need money for to do well. And, you know, that's a very integral aspect of the game industry, but at the same time, I think that indie games also fill, they're kind of like more of a sincere, take on games sometimes, like just kind of boil down, like what does it take to make a game? They boil it down to the, 
the raw essentials. So you get some really great titles. Were tiny homebrew games not really a thing back in MS-DOS days in the States? No, they were. I think that's why I said it's a, sort of a renaissance. Because back then it was kind of just, that's all there was, right? Is people making games in their spare time, mostly. Um, that's kind of how the industry got started. <coughs> but then there was kind of like this big sweep towards um, like the big budget games. At least that's what I, I feel like. I mean, <laughs> I wasn't paying that close of attention at, at that point in my life. But... Um, then I feel like there was kind of this big breakup of a lot of companies, and now we're kind of going back to uh, a lot of smaller independent studios forming. I mean, now they're just all over the place, it seems like. I have played more than 4K hours, and I'm still amazed by the details, and I still find new stuff. I love that. Wow, thanks. <laughs> that's, uh, that's quite an investment of time. Um, I hope it was worth it. <laughs> I mean, it's great that you guys can find that much replayability in this game. That's just incredible to me. So I really want to make sure that these uh, nostrils look more like slits, not like an actual skeleton. I want it to look extra creepy. Maybe to bring in some wrinkles too. So something else you guys might have noticed um, is I typically sculpt in uh, symmetry mode. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. Uh, the biggest one is it's a huge time saver. And <laughs> most people probably don't notice when things are mirrored. Um, so it's just it's a very practical thing. Um, it's also a good performance saver. Um, the creatures are typically less complex um, when there's symmetry. Um, the textures can also be higher res. Um, because you can mirror the, the texture map as well, so you get a higher fidelity of texture with a smaller resolution. Yeah, so these teeth are still even kind of muddy at this level of detail. So I'll probably have to go through here and uh, take it up another level. I, I probably won't do a full re-sculpt at that level because that, that detail tends to get lost. Um, this level of detail is probably just about perfect for our game. Um, from about this distance, it looks fine. <laughs> if you get in too close, you start to see, you know, it gets kind of muddy, but nobody gets in that close on our engine. Again, it's one of the nice things about having a camera that's so far away. So let's give this guy some big fangs here. See, one of the problems with this dynamic mesh, though, is you sometimes get these weird points here. 
not a whole lot I can do about that at this point, unfortunately. Um, you usually just kind of have to deal with it. But that can make sculpting a bit of a pain. Because you've got to smooth this area now, it kind of smooths weirdly. So I usually just kind of work around it by using a um, different brush that kind of flattens things out. So I'll get the basic form in and then I'll kind of shape it with that flattening brush. Uh, so in addition to using symmetry, are there then tools that add minor variation afterwards? Um, that's a good question. Uh, most of the characters I'd say I typically just leave them as symmetrical. And there's a couple of reasons again for that, usually it's time saving. <laughs> so on, on the model making level, uh, symmetry is just so much easier to work with. Um, and when you actually get the model uh, skinned and rigged, having symmetry there is also easier for the rigger because they can literally just mirror the bones um, and mirror the weights so that everything deforms evenly. But um, there are some monsters that um, aren't symmetrical or maybe they have parts that it's good to have variation for. Um, so what I'll typically do with those, depending on the level of uh, asymmetry, I will sculpt everything symmetrically and then distort one side. And sometimes I'll do that after I've done all the texturing, all of the, the baking, all that stuff, because then I can still keep the mirrored textures, but then the mesh itself is distorted and asymmetrical, if that makes any sense. Working this way makes everything symmetrical. Isn't there a downside to that? Okay, so going back to what I was just saying, um, I mean, yeah, if you're, if you're thinking like perfection wise, then you're losing some, uh, you're, losing, you're losing some detail there, right? You're losing some realism, but I think the majority of people aren't really going to notice when you do mirror things. And if they do, they just kind of say, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and it's just like the time savings are so massive. Um, like, I mean, depending on how asymmetrical we're talking about here, um, it could be the difference of like several days, you know? So say for example, if I spend um, on average, like three or four days making a creature. Um, if I make an asymmetrical creature, it could be like five or six days because it's just, it's more sculpting and more texturing. And then the rigor has to do more work also. Um, so yeah, there's a downside to it. You know, if it was a perfect world, if it was a, if it was a triple A game, um, we'd probably have a lot more asymmetrical stuff. But again, it's kind of one of those things that we just have to suck up. You know, I'm just realizing I should probably make these teeth sharper. This guy's a monster, and he's not going to be eating rice and stuff, right? I'm going to be able to chew through that meat. But you can't make a scar beneath one eye, for example, while texturing, just trying to understand the possibilities. Right, so there are a couple ways of doing it. Um, you, could, you could do full symmetry, where you do a symmetrical sculpt, you do a symmetrical uh, texture layout, and everything is mirrored. So then when you do your textures, if you had a scar under the eye, um, it would be on both eyes, right? So there's another compromise to that, which is you do the sculpt symmetrically, um, where everything is mirrored, and then when you go to, to lay out the texture map, you actually, um, you, you make the texture map unique, at least for parts. Like say for example, what I'll do sometimes for some monsters or, or characters is I'll, I'll do everything symmetrically in the sculpt. And then when I unwrap it, I'll, I'll have, typically for faces or like the torso, something that's gonna be more high profile or more obviously mirrored is I'll, I'll unwrap it asymmetrically. And then you can texture both sides uniquely. And so even though the sculpt is identical on both sides, because the textures are slightly different, um, it actually hides a lot of that.
This is a gargoyle made out of stone. What does he even eat? Uh, probably everything. I mean, it's not just stone. It's kind of like a stone flesh hybrid. Probably some new material. I don't know. Flesh stone. Like picture, picture lava, but uh, like skin. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he eats you. I'm gonna guess. I don't know. What do you what do you think, Zantai? I'm not sure how mean he's gonna make these guys. <laughs> Another thing is, is it's good to keep in mind when you're sculpting. It's always good to kinda keep rotating um, as you sculpt because sometimes you find that the proportions you had don't quite work and it's good to be able to see it from multiple angles at a time so for example i might want to pull out this area a little bit more to give him a little bit more of that overbite and kind of define where his gums would be <laughs> not that he really has them but you know gotta try to keep some level of realism Do I have an artisan page or a personal website? Uh, I used to have a website. I haven't really kept up with it though. <laughs> and I think I actually let the, um, the page expire. But no, I don't have anything at this point. It's one of those things where, you know, it might be nice to have, but it's just more time and less time I get to work on this and <laughs> less time I get to live, you know, all that stuff. So something's gotta give. <laughs> so are you actually going to buy a million copies? I mean, <laughs> if you personally buy one million copies, can I have Grimdon too? Wow, that's a lot of copies. That'd be very nice. Made me very friendly. Another thing I want to try to do with this guy is give him these really kind of needly looking teeth. Oh yeah, something I should mention is uh, since this guy is based on the Rylock rig, um, unfortunately I can't give him a mouth that opens, at least not without doing a lot of um, revision work to the rig. Um, so we're trying to keep this guy from being too big of an impact on the, on the rig situation. So he's going to end up with a, a fused mouth, unfortunately. So that's one, that's one of the limitations of reusing rigs. Um, you can actually add more stuff into rigs um, and still reuse them, but you know, it just adds to the, uh, the complexity of, of remaking things. And it's one of those details where it's probably not worth it on this guy because then we also have to modify all the animations to have um, mouth opens and that kind of thing. I want to give this guy a bit more of a teeth bulge here. Yeah. That's looking creepy.
What's the name of the software? The software is, oh, somebody already answered it. <laughs> ZBrush. So here's another tool I'll use sometimes. It's um, let me do that again. It's the uh, inflate tool. Sorry, I can't even find it now. Oh yeah, here it is. So the inflate tool um, is pretty nice when you kind of do a first pass on stuff. Uh, if you use it selectively, you can end up defining some really cool creases um, because what the inflate tool will do is it's basically just like a bulge. So if you use it selectively in certain areas, you can kind of tighten up these crevices really nicely and. If you're trying to go for sort of a fleshy area, um, then it kind of makes those pop a little bit, gives you those nice tight creases, and then uh, then you can go back in and tighten them up a little bit more if you want that hard edge on the on the on the top. So now it just kind of pulls everything together a little bit, makes it look like it might have been a bit more natural, less like somebody went in there and actually sculpted it more like it kind of grew together. It's also nice to, to do that on the teeth. They'll need a little bit more touch up after that because you know, you want the teeth to still have some hard edges on them. But you see how it's just kind of pulling these cracks together now, which is really nice. You get that cleaner look pretty quick. And then you can go back in. Oops, that's the wrong key. Go back in with this um, flattening brush to kind of pull back some of that bubbliness that we got from the, the inflate tool. Give it a more of a teeth-like look. And again, I might still go through these on a higher diff or <laughs> higher difficulty level, higher uh, subdivision level, to try to clean up the teeth a little bit more. We'll see how that goes. For this stream, I think I'm just going to keep it at this level though. Don't want to get too carried away. How <laughs> I saved recently? That's the best question I've heard all day. That's a great thing. All right, I'm going to save right now. Good call. Yeah, I usually I'm pretty good about that, but uh, I get distracted when I'm talking to you guys, so that's a really nice reminder to have <laughs> because this is one of the, um, I mean, it's a great program and all, but man, it is one of the buggiest programs out there. Um, I don't think I've ever had a program crash on me while saving other than in ZBrush. This program, it's pretty great, you know, you think, oh, I haven't saved for a while, I better save to make sure that this thing, you know, doesn't crash on me. And you go save and bam, crash. <laughs> so then you, it's like adding insult to injury. Not only did you lose the work that you were trying to avoid losing, but yeah, it's just, it's good stuff. So now I'm seeing his jawline's looking a little bit thin here. His teeth are getting a little carried away now, so I'm going to try to pull that down a bit more. I might have to shrink his head a little bit too, but we'll see. Maybe I'll just pull, let me make him a little smiley. Got a bit of a grin on him now. jawline a little bit more. Get that chiseled chin, you know? The ladies, the ladies swoon for it. <laughs> chiseled butt chin. I don't know if we'll give him a butt chin, that might be a little weird. I don't know, let's see, what do you think? Yeah, it's a little weird. <laughs> I think I like the pointy chin better. Jay Leno. <laughs> you know, I can't say that wasn't a reference for me. So now his, now his teeth are looking a little bulgy to me. I think I need to reshape this a little bit.
So this is the move tool, which is a nice kind of <laughs> handicap, not handicap, um, crutch to rely on. When you inevitably mess something up, um, you can just kind of nudge things around like this with the move tool, which is great. Um, Cause you know, proportions are never going to be perfect, at least not for me. So I usually end up kind of tweaking things as I go. Um, and that's another nice thing about using dynamic mesh at this point. Um, I think I, for those of you who missed that, um, this is no longer dynamic, but it's based off of a, a dynamic mesh. So the actual topology is nowhere near game ready. Um, you try to animate this thing, it would look like crap. But it's really nice for, for just roughing in stuff. And it's also nice because at this point, um, I can nudge things around. I can really kind of push and pull stuff and, and not worry about disrupting the, the topology. You know, so I can I can stretch things like crazy right now if I really wanted to, and um, I don't have to worry about fixing the topology later because I'm just going to redo the the whole topology at some point. So I'm starting to see that these wrinkles here are looking a little bit too much like he's got really squinty eyes, so I might pull this back a little bit. I think part of what makes this design feel creepy is that there wasn't really any clear indication of where an eye was. I mean, you can, you know, your brain will infer where an eye should be, but we don't want there to, to look like there's an eye. Like, now this kind of looks like an eye, this weird little doohickey here. Just make that. There we go, nice. It's funny how your brain just finds faces when you when you do stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Herp. So just gonna pull a little bit, pull some of these details back a little. Keep it a little bit more discreet. Sometimes less is more, you know. At this point, does your modeling uh, in your modeling does this asset belong to you or Crate Entertainment? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. Uh, probably Crate, <laughs> since I'm working for Crate. Uh, let's see. His arms seem a little bit off to me. Um, so yeah, uh, at this point, things are going to look a little funky. Um, if you're talking about just the proportions, then, you know, it's also partially because he's kind of squatting. I think if he was standing up straight, he would look a little more natural. Um, it's partially just his rig pose, I think. But another issue is that since we're working with an existing rig, we can't really tweak the proportions too much. But if he ends up looking really funky in game, we'll probably, um, we'll figure out something. So let's see if we can get any more of this face here. Let's clean up this uh, crystally looking thing. Maybe he sees out of this crystal, you know? It's kind of like a Eye of Sauron or something. Uh, at Crane Entertainment, brain finding faces, I see them all the time in maps, is a huge smiley in the queen's nest. <laughs> yep, that is, uh, as soon as that map happened, that was my first comment too, but it's, it's kind of, it's kind of endearing, I don't know. Kind of turned out, you know, derpy face for the derp queen. Seems appropriate, right? But, yeah, I think it's just natural for brains to 
find faces. I mean, we're so face centric as a species. It is funny when you find faces in just inanimate objects, though. <laughs> At Almanaxi, we need giant gloves to make it happen. Um, giant gloves, probably not going to happen. <laughs> That's just largely because of the limitations of the tech. Um, we don't really have a good way to incorporate something like that with the character's proportions at this point. Yeah, um, another comment about the arms, um, if his arms look swollen, um, it's, it's probably largely just because I haven't finished sculpting them. So a lot of the proportions are still a little wonky. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that <laughs> I tend to not do the arms until last because they're my least favorite uh, part, just because fingers are kind of a pain. It's like a kind of a, a lot of work and not very much reward, whereas something like the face, you know, the face is probably my favorite because you can make a pretty big impact on the way the character feels in a relatively short amount of time. And then I'd say probably feet are my second worst favorite, second least favorite. details back in a little bit more or pull them out depending on how you look at it. Uh, I create entertainment. Can we expect a gazer woman? And if yes, can we get a twist like all mouse instead of eyes? I mean, who's to say that gazer man isn't really a woman or a man? I mean, gazer man just kind of a name, you know? I think gazer man might be all-encompassing. I can't really speak for gazer man though, as I'm not really his en her envoy. It's envoy. Maybe maybe Zantai can shed some light on that. Gazes with its mouth. <laughs> That's the Eldritch Gazer, man. I mean, if you think about it, woman has man in it, right? So Gazer Man is sort of like, you could say it's woman, Gazer Man, right? It's not like women are men. It's its own gender. It's the, the gazer gender. <laughs> Will this monster have eyes? Uh, no. This monster does not have physical eyes. Eyes are overrated. <laughs> That's right. Why, why have eyes when you can see everything? I mean, I'm not saying these guys can see everything, but... Possible. Yeah, I suppose it could smell you. Um, it does have a nose. 
So maybe if you're really quiet and take a lot of showers, you'll be safe. Well, I don't really make ears for this guy. We could just say his horns or his ears. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Wormel del Toro's creature designs too, and he, he tends to kind of fall back a lot on those kind of eyeless, faceless creatures. I've always really thought those were especially creepy. Like in Pan's Labyrinth, oh man. <laughs> it will be retextured with googly eyes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Clean up his gums a little bit. No gingivitis here. It's all that floss, you know, from the, the tendons that he chews on. So yeah, I'm just kind of noodling away here at this face now. Um, sorry, I've been kind of quiet these last few minutes. Kind of get to the start getting into the zone when I do this. But let me know if you guys have any more questions about this process. I'll be glad to, to talk about it a little bit more. I think at this point I might um, it might be good to stop working on the face for a bit. I'll just do a few more proportion tweaks on them. Try to pull out these cheekbones a bit, give him that structure he deserves. <laughs> yeah, now we're talking. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> That's better, right? Yeah, now we're talking. Let's go ahead and save that. No. Oh, he's sad now. Make sure we really sculpt out this under jawline because that's like one of those those key points. You know, you want to make sure he makes a really good impression on players. So it's good to make sure he has a nice clean under jaw. <laughs> All right. 
Well, that's probably good enough for now. Come back and clean that up in a bit. So now I'm actually gonna hide the head. So we come in and start pulling in some details on his neck and shoulders. At Crate Entertainment, are all monsters created from start to finish in ZBrush? Uh, no. ZBrush is usually an integral part of the creating a monster, um, but the actual monster itself is typically finished in uh, 3D Studio Max uh, to create the low poly game ready version. Holy, holy crap, did somebody just pull in Heroes of Night Magic 2? <laughs> That's like one of my favorite games of all time. I haven't played that game in ages though. It's definitely a formative game for my childhood. Probably could have been a much better artist if it wasn't for that game, in fact. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, how much time to create this? Um, it depends. Usually, on average, I'd say it's about three to four days from start to finish. Um, whoa, just change colors. Uh, what the heck? Come on, give me back. What the heck? Now I went and did something. I don't know what I did. <laughs> it's funny how that's... Oh, I see what I did. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, I don't remember. <clears throat> High poly and ZBrush and low poly and 3D Studio Max, right? Yes, that's that's basically the gist of it, yeah. Um, sometimes I'll use a, a third program for retopologizing because it's a little easier than doing it in Max. Um, yeah, Heroes of Might and Magic 3. Somebody's commented about that. Um, that was also really good. I mean, I think Heroes 2 was just kind of hit a sweet spot in my life. I think objectively Heroes 3 was a better game, though. And I mean, Heroes 5, I saw somebody comment on Heroes 5 as being the best Heroes game ever. It's just a 3D version of Heroes of Night Magic 3, you know? I mean, disagree with me there. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. I feel like every game that's come out since, well, since Ubisoft bought 3DO um, has just been Heroes 5 reskinned, basically. Or Heroes 3 reskinned. I would love if they, you know, actually made a, a new game with new mechanics and new monsters, but I feel like it's the same stuff, just recycled. Yeah, I mean, 5 was fine. It just, it was like a 3D version of 3, basically. Something I'd really love to see in a, in a Heroes game is... Um, one of the things I really liked about Heroes 2 was they had, like, asymmetrical upgrades. So, I mean, not only did you have the different... Um, classes, right, the different races, but you also had, like, some creatures that didn't have any upgrades, some creatures that had, like, two upgrades, like the dragons had, you know, you had the green and the red and the black. I don't know, I just thought that was really cool, and it kind of gave more flavor to each monster, and a different kind of town-building strategy. And I really missed that, and they never brought that back for some reason. Maybe it wasn't as popular as I thought it was, but I thought it was cool. Heroes 5 had the best OST? Wait a second, did you ever listen to Heroes 2 soundtrack? Heroes 2 had killer. So did Heroes 4, actually. There's one thing you'd say about Heroes 4 is it had awesome music. I mean, I guess you could say Heroes 2 wasn't great because some of its stuff was like MIDI, but... <laughs> I think there was like a orchestra version of the soundtrack that was pretty nice, if I remember correctly. It's been a while though. Yeah, Heroes 5 is still a great game. Um, sometimes I'll just go back and play those old games just because they, well, for one thing, nostalgia really <laughs> makes those things feel way more fun than they might be objectively. But they do, they, I mean, they are good games, you know? It's just if you can get over the, sometimes the old dated artwork. 
That's what nostalgia is good for, though. Helps you overcome that barrier. That is a pretty weird phenomenon I've noticed. Like, if I try to go back and play an old game, like from the probably late 90s, um, if I've never played it before, like as a kid, it's really hard to get into it because you know, the graphics are so dated looking. But if there's a game that you played from the same era um, when you were a kid, it's like your brain just doesn't care because <laughs> you remembered it looking that way as a kid, and so in your head it just still looks good or something. I don't know, the style is just pretty weird like that. YouTube has the CD orchestra music from Heroes Might Magic 2. The ones you find on the internet are mostly MIDI. Yeah, I, I could have sworn there was like a there was like an option in game to change it from MIDI to orchestra. So that sounds right. I feel like Heroes of My Magic 2 was like one of the first games I'd ever played that had actual opera. <laughs> I think it was actually the Necromancer um, town. Or maybe it was the... Maybe it was the... Maybe they all had opera, I can't remember now. If you like let the music in the town play long enough, it would just break into opera at some point. It's like, whoa! <laughs> Am I still working in symmetry mode? Yes. It's just hard to see because I'm only working on one side, but hopefully that helps you visualize it. That's a good question though, because like <laughs> sometimes it, there's a hotkey for it and it's X, and it's very close to, well, it's very close to several keys that you press when you're working. Um, so it's not unheard of to accidentally press X and <laughs> go on sculpting for like a half an hour and then only realize that you've had symmetry off. For like the last half hour and it's just like oh god damn it there is a way to get around it but it's a little buggy um you can reproject symmetry uh assuming you haven't screwed it up too bad but sometimes that reprojection stuff gets a little wonky so generally speaking it's a good idea to avoid it avoid turning it off unintentionally that is <clears throat> I tried D2 for the first time recently, been having fun. Wow, <laughs> that's quite a throwback. I mean, I know a lot of people still play that game, though. I've actually considered picking it up again if I could find my old copy just to see if it's what I remember. But I haven't played that since, I don't know, 2003, 2004? Something like that. Played the crap out of that game, though. Also the game where I made a crossbow that fired exploding pitchforks. <laughs> Wait, was this in Dungeon Siege 2? That sounds pretty good. Yeah, we need to get on that pitchfork launcher train. I feel like pitchfork would be like a new weapon type though, you know? Like spear or staff. Could be the farmer class. <laughs> Get the pitchfork mastery. It's like the vernacular Grim Dawn, <laughs> where all the classes are like milkmaid and uh, farmer, and I don't know. Sounds like a spin off to me. What do you think?
Pitchfork Master on the Scarecrow build. All right, <laughs> let's make it happen. I'm not a designer, so I can't, I can't, you know, I can't actually implement that stuff. But. You missed the, uh, the new vernacular Grim Dawn with the farmer class and the milkmaid class. What other ones we have in there? The lumberjack, maybe? Uh, Create Entertainment, does the model you're working on now feed into the lighting model in any way? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> I don't know how familiar you are with normal maps, but normal maps basically are the end product of this sculpt that I'm working on right now. Um, so basically when I'm done with this model in, in ZBrush, um, I'll take this model and then I'll make a low res version off of it. So for example, if this model is like a million polygons, um, I'll take it into another program and create sort of a low poly cage around it and it'll be like roughly 5,000 triangles and then I'll take that 5,000 triangle model and I'll make the texture map for it um, and then I'll basically project or bake as we call it the high res model onto the low res model and the, the product you get is a normal map and the normal map is basically just a way of storing all this light information that the high res model has so it's a pretty cool little uh, I don't know if it's a trick, but it's a cool piece of tech that uh, the game industry relies on. Um, nowadays, a lot of the um, the better engines are just the like AAA games that have you know the, the first person high res models. They'll actually use real time displacement mapping, which is like the next step up from normal maps. It's literally uh, subdividing the model in game, so you're seeing like fully uh, tessellated models of like a million polygons. Sometimes I don't know how high they go, but it's pretty cool tech. But that doesn't happen in Grim Dawn. We don't have that kind of sweet stuff. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I am the guy behind the monster designs uh, path horror. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. It's a lot of fun making monsters in Grim Dawn, and it's um, it's good to hear that people don't hate them. <laughs> so yeah, I appreciate that. Well guys, um, so we're getting kind of on in the session, so let me just take like a quick opinion poll and see what you guys want to do. Um, I could keep working on this guy for like another 20 or 30 minutes, or I could switch bases, um, pull up a couple of new models, well, maybe new to you guys, maybe not, um, and just talk a little bit about how I made those. Um, they might contain some mild spoilers, so if that sounds interesting, just let me know uh, in the comments. Um, I'll just keep working for a couple minutes and I'll check back. <laughs> you know, soft spoilers. Just the tip. <laughs> All right, well, I think uh, including the word spoilers in there was a kind of a trigger. Um, I mean, only in the sense that you guys haven't seen the sculpts of these creatures. I think, uh, you know, nothing too crazy. But sure, let's, um, let's see. 
Oh, let me think for a second. Um, okay, yeah, so we got somebody mentioned the Griffin stages. Um, that might be cool to check out. Sure, I can pull that guy up. Um, because we already talked a little bit about him and you guys, some of you had seen me working on him um, last month or whenever that was. Um, do I also make objects for skills in the software? Oh, <laughs> no, not usually. We have um, our own tool set um, like for making particle effects. Um, Sky Shard is, I can't remember if it has a mesh component to it or not even. I think it might. Um, but yeah, typically those will just be um, particle effects and sometimes we'll have a piece of mesh. And I guess, yeah, there's a few meshes that might have some component of ZBrush in them at some point, but most of them are just kind of simple because they're usually glowing and they don't really have any detail. So yeah, I can't remember what mesh it uses though. It probably uses Probably uses an ether crystal if I had to guess, and that was technically sculpted in ZBrush, but you know, nobody ever notices it because it's just glowing. But we had it, so I was like, why not just use it? Um, we we re reuse stuff occasionally, you know. <laughs> it's an, an understatement. So this is my latest masterpiece. Um, tell me what you guys think. The dreaded cylinder. <clears throat> I like how you guys can see the mouse cursor, but you can't see what I'm actually looking at. It's kind of nice. What's he doing? All right, let's pull up this guy. So, uh, <laughs> here's our Chibi Griffin. He started off really happy and cute. He's just really excited about the world. And then the soul-crushing weight of reality finally got to him. So that turned into this guy. Just kind of pulled in a few more of the <clears throat> rough details. Uh, trying to get the proportions more what I was going for. Still looks pretty happy, though. <laughs> Kenny. Yeah, he is kind of a weird cat, you know? I mean, if you think about it, cats kind of... I don't know, I feel like cats and owls kind of share some some traits, you know? Like if you look at an owl and you look at a cat, I feel like you can kind of see some similarities there. So I don't think that's too far, too much of a stretch. So why did that, oh, here we go. So that turned into this guy. Um, I think at this point, oh yeah, here's something I can talk about. Or maybe I can't. Oh yeah, so this was this one I did a little differently than, than the other guy. Um, you can see this this poly uh, cage here is um, a little different looking than it was for this guy. Um, if I go back down to low res here, so he's um, he was a dynamic mesh. I think I talked about that. Um, but the Griffin started off as being uh, from Max, and sometimes I'll do that for uh, creatures that don't have like a pre-existing model um, because it's sometimes easier to, to start with a base, like get the the limbs extruded and just the basics kind of in place in Max before I come into ZBrush. Um, and I can't tell you why, just sometimes it's, it's easy for my brain to, to do it that way. So there's a couple of different approaches to it. But, so that turned into this guy, this guy turned into this guy. I think I was like, okay, it's close to the proportions I want. I'm gonna start adding in some details. So I was getting in on his face there, getting some feathers and stuff. Um, we have now? That's three. So let's go to four. Okay, so some of these are going to be just kind of small incremental changes. Again, this is some more proportional tweaks, um, a little bit more refinement on the muscles and stuff like that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and skip a couple steps here because I don't think a lot happens in the middle, but let's see where this one takes me. Yeah, it's still kind of not a lot going on here. Oh, I think I might have been starting to... Oh, whoops, my bad. <laughs> I forgot that I had the... Um... Uh, the solo mode on, which only shows one layer at a time. So let's go back here. Okay, yeah, so that's that's why he was looking so bald. Um, I had done the feathers separately. Um, hang on, let me check the comments, make sure I didn't miss anything. All right. So yeah, um, the feathers were a real pain in the ass, as you can probably imagine. Um, 
what I did for these guys is rather than modeling them on the Griffin in ZBrush, I decided to make them in, in Max, and then I import. Well, then I deformed them around the Griffin, got them close, and then I brought them back into ZBrush and tweaked their their position and their proportions a bit more to fit the model. And that was pretty time consuming because, I mean, these are all individual meshes, and it just took a while to get everything laid out correctly. But I think it ended up working out a lot better than trying to sculpt these individually um, because. That would just be a lot of re-sculpting. I think it would have taken a lot longer. Um, and so, yes, yeah, I see somebody asking here how I made the feathers. I don't know, did that answer your question? Um, let me know if it didn't. <laughs> yeah, get out of here. Let's jump ahead a little bit more. Probably gonna crash the brush here, loading all these meshes in here. Um, Okay, yeah, so I think this is, um, I think the Griffin was mostly, my ZBrush portion of the Griffin was mostly done at this point. Um, I think this is where I switched over to the Stone Griffin, which you guys saw me working on. Um, so let me go ahead and load some progress in from that guy. This might be too far ahead, but... Oh dear. I might have just crashed eBrush. Nope, nope, there we go. Okay. Oh, so this is like the final version of this guy. Um, but that's probably fine. I don't know if I saved a lot of iterations on him. But uh, you guys saw, some of you saw me working on the head, and I think I had started on some of the armor pieces too. But this was just more or less the finished version of him. Um, again, the wings were kind of a pain in the butt. Um, because I ended up making them in Max again, but they weren't exactly the same as the feathers uh, for the for the living Griffin because this guy's got you know stone. So I made them thicker, um, which ultimately probably didn't matter because I just used this as like a basis, and the wings are actually a plane that the that the mesh is projected onto. So the fact that they have dimension isn't really important, <laughs> but it just seemed appropriate at the time. I didn't really add any extra time to making them. It just, they feel a little more hefty that way when I was sculpting it. So that's why I did it. But, um, am I the only guy who works on art design? Uh, no. So we are a small company and we do kind of jump around a lot. Um, I don't, I don't just do, um, monsters, but, um, we have, uh, two other artists that, um, that do a lot of other stuff as well. So we all kind of tag team it and get things done. So yeah, that's the Griffin um, and the Stone Griffin. So let's move on to Uncharted Territory. What do you guys say? All right, let's try this guy out. Oh, huh. what's this? We got the crabs. <laughs> so this guy was kind of interesting because um, he's actually broken into several different pieces. And a lot of models I'll make I'll just kind of sculpt uniformly um, because that's the way mesh would normally work. But this guy, he's more like a crustacean, as you can tell. So I broke everything into separate segments. Um, and the nice thing about this is when when he dies, he'll explode into a, a bunch of different pieces, and it should be a little bit more satisfying. <laughs> so let's jump ahead to the end. 
So here's what he more or less looked like finished. Get some of the little divots on his head. Break up the smoothness of him. So another thing I should comment on here is uh, he's not actually missing arms. Um, it's just when I model them in, in ZBrush, I don't duplicate things uh, the way they will in the final version because it just doesn't really need to happen. Um, so I only do like the one version, and that's also partially because when I when I bake the textures, um, there's no reason to have the duplicates because these all say, um, these little segments here share the same texture space. So having more pieces. Um, at this point in the, the pipeline doesn't really make any sense. In fact, it just clutters things up. So I'll add in the other pieces after all the textures are baked in, basically. And baking this guy was kind of weird because um, if you want to bake things together, you have to either export all these pieces individually or you have to separate everything physically in space. So you end up with this weird exploded looking model where all the arms are kind of floating and weird <laughs> places, but that's just how it works. Oh, okay, actually, you know what? I can pull this guy up. Hang on a second. Uh, where am I? Sorry, guys. This will just take another second. some of this crap so it doesn't look too cluttered. Alright, I'll probably do. Um, Alright, you guys see this okay? <laughs> What's this about hating me? <laughs> Get a full crab man armor set. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we could probably do the shoulders pretty easy. I'm not sure if that's planned or not, but they're separate, so. Uh, anyway, so this is the, uh, the low-res version of him, the in-game model. Uh, he's rigged here, so it's kind of fun because you can kind of play around with him and see how his bits move. One of the fun things about his tail, too, is um, it's got some stretch to it. So when he attacks, it can kind of snap forward. So it might look like he's close range, but you got to watch out for that. Need more flying gibs? Yeah, so that's that was the idea with this guy. This guy's gonna gib like crazy. Um, I mean, we have to be semi-responsible because you know we don't want to kill computers. But uh, basically, all of his joints are gonna be able to gib. Um, I think his lower leg here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, his lower leg can gib. His upper leg can gib. These little arms can gib. His pinches can gib. 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 I'm not sure if this will give, um, but his head can also give. Uh, does his tail go over his head to attack? Yeah, it's possible. I'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility. So, let's see. I don't know, I think we have time for one more maybe. Here we go. The dreaded star. Oh wait, I'm just, you guys can't see anything. Sorry, my bad. Here we go. The moment you guys have been waiting for.
Hmm. All right, so here, <laughs> this is actually, um, I think, a part of the Hellhound, like an earlier stage of the Hellhound. And that was a starting point for this next guy here. So it uses the same rig, and this is where it's starting to come together. Spiky dog. Still pretty rough. Um, oh yeah, so this guy, I think I, I switched over to dynamic mesh, um, similar to the the guy I was just working on, the uh, gargoyle. <laughs> Can you believe that started off as a star? <laughs> This is getting pretty close to done here. I think this was before I went through one more final detail pass. Yeah, emaciated puppy, not happy. Seen better days. Yeah, this is the final. So you can see here, it's it's similar um, in, in shape and everything, but the only difference really is that I clean up a lot of those details, so it, it doesn't have any of that cluttered noise in there. And it's nice for when you're baking the texture because then you don't get those weird little chunky bits. <clears throat> so, what was I going to say about this guy? Oh yeah, so um, I should mention that somebody, when we were talking about the symmetry earlier, uh, this guy was all done symmetrically, but what I did uh, after I was done with, with the bake and everything, after I had the low res version, I actually went in and um, individually tweaked these spikes so they don't all point the same direction. And it's a minor thing, like probably no one will really notice it, but it was also relatively easy to do, so it just kind of breaks up that that sort of star pattern you get there, um, just to make it look a little bit more natural, I guess. So that's one way to get around the whole symmetry limitation. Um, you can still have symmetrical sculpts, symmetrical textures, but the actual mesh itself is not symmetrical, or at least not 100% not symmetrical. Let me just check the comments real quick. What's the res in Dynamesh? Um, this guy it says it's um, 1.2 million, so I guess that's like 2.5 million. Uh, it's not actually Dynamesh anymore, it's just based off of Dynamesh. Um, if I turned on Dynamesh again, it would just kind of smooth it right back out. Uh, but yeah, I usually don't. I usually only switch to Dynamesh when I'm still roughing in the the shapes. Like once I get everything extruded where I want it, I'll usually switch back to normal mesh and then just subdivide it to actually sculpt in the details. <clears throat> so yeah, guys. Um, I think that's about all I can show you today, but um, let me know if you have any more questions real quick before we wrap this up. Um, if not, it's been nice having you guys here. Thanks for stopping in. So yeah, if you have any other questions, hit me up now. Hey, thanks guys. <laughs> I really appreciate that. You know, it's, uh, it's, it feels kind of weird because I feel like I'm just talking to myself. So <laughs> let me know if I sound like an idiot or something, but it's great having you guys here. We really appreciate you coming by. Um, you know, we couldn't do it without you guys. So thank you so much. You guys, you know, you're the reason why we're here. So it's, it's really great. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, Zanta and I actually, we worked together. I don't think we really know each other or knew each other at 38 Studios. That's how big the company was. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's saying the exact same thing. Cool. <laughs> But yeah, guys. All right. So uh, thanks again for stopping by. Um, be sure to stop in next time. Uh, not sure when the next one will be, but we'll let you know. Um, I know this was a bit short notice, uh, but we'll try to let you guys know a little bit more in advance next time. Um, also, stay tuned for some new announcements coming down the pipe. Um, got some more things coming up. Not sure how much I'm allowed to say at this point. But anyway, guys, I'm going to wrap it up here. So take care. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time. Oh, here, let me, uh, let me play you guys some music before we head out in case anyone missed it. Let's do this one. I'll play you guys out with some music.
All right, guys, that's it. Hope you enjoyed that little taste of the upcoming music for the expansion. Uh, be sure to stop by next Monday for the next uh, latest dev update, and we'll see you around. Thanks again for stopping by.